Well, it's interesting, isn't it, that this has become a human rights issue for the right of women to be prostituted. If we listen to Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, apologists for the sex trade, punters, those that claim that disabled men can't get a real date, all of these excuses, um, it's always about the rights of the women. And whether it's the women who are apologists for the sex trade or whether it's the men, whether it's pimps, whether it's lobbyists, activists, ideologues within the academy or outside of it, it has become in this neoliberal world where the human body is a marketplace except for when you're a man, about the rights of the woman. How dare we tell women that they can't consent to sex work? Well, last time I looked, nobody was. Nobody was telling the women anything of the sort. We were suggesting that every single bit of credible evidence from women in the sex trade and out of it shows that this is a human rights violation of the highest order perpetrated by the sex buyers and the pimps and not a right for the women at all. So when I was doing the research, I talked to a number of men who pay for sex and their apologists, and I've done this work. I mentioned that Fiona Broadfoot and I started doing this with Jal Nahanma, another great abolitionist colleague who's here, back in the late 1990s. It was the first time in the UK that the focus had gone on the Johns. And how we did it, and her name has been mentioned tonight, Vanita, you've been honoured by her, Norma Hoteling, a sex trade survivor who exited, helped other women exit, and told the police in San Francisco where she lived, this isn't acceptable. You're arresting the women and they're going back out on the streets. Here's an idea. Arrest the Johns. We'll take them off your hands for a few days. Show them the error of their ways and charge them for the privilege. And that money will go into the exit strategies. And when we heard about this, we thought, great, it's a way to focus on the men. Because we know the battles that women have in violence against women at work and campaigning. As soon as you mention the perpetrator, all hell breaks loose. If you're talking about rape crisis and victims and services, you're fine. But if you suggest that one ingenious way to stop rape right now is that men choose not to rape, people go berserk. Um, first of all, I want to say thank you. Um, thank you to my survivor sisters. But <laughs> but I want to say thank you to Julie. Because Julie very seldom gets any thanks. <laughs> when I met Julie, um, I was expecting my son. Um, it was 21 years ago and I had barely been out of prostitution for you know, not very long. Julie has supported me, loved me, um, spoke out for me, um, gave me a bed, gave me a gin, <laughs> listened to me on the telephone endlessly, years, year upon year upon year upon year, whilst interviewing, supporting, speaking out and being harangued publicly, disgusting, vile accusations towards this amazing, amazing, amazing woman. Thank you, Julie. Thank you. I will be forever <laughs> eternally grateful. Thank you. Thank you. Well, there are two chapters in the book, one on the AIDS and HIV movement and its links to the pro-prostitution lobby and, and funding, of course. And the other is a queer defence of the sex trade, which is looking at the way that the Rainbow Alliance um, has now embraced, um, well, anyone actually, apart from the bloke who washes his car on a Sunday morning with a comb over and a car coat, uh, who has missionary position heterosexual sex once a month. <coughs> Everyone else is queer. All you have to do is dye your fringe orange, right? Uh, and a, a real thanks to Sheila Jeffries tonight for exposing this um, in, her, in her brilliant work on, on the, the queer eels. Um, so, 
What was really worrying to me, uh, looking at the way that the HIV and AIDS prevention movement, as Samira said, an extremely important piece of work globally, has latched onto this idea that the condom is king. That all you have to do is flood areas with condoms. So whether it's Sonagachi, one of the biggest street uh, sex markets in India, um, or, or gay male cruising areas, or, or any at-risk community, that the condom is what's needed, and that billions of pounds of George Soros and Bill and Melinda Gates' money goes into these organisations that don't just give out condoms to at-risk groups. So in other words, um, gay and bisexual men and, and prostituted people, but that campaign and lobby for blanket decriminalisation of the sex trade, because the idea, the theory is that, of course, this means that if nobody in the entire sex trade is arrested, because we buy the bit about the women not being arrested being safer, right, that if you decriminalise pimps and sex buyers and all of the scumbags, that the women are more likely to, what, force her John to put a condom on. Presumably, there's some kind of police officer in the bedroom putting it on his dick at the time. I don't know. This, this is the concept of harm reduction. It's harm reduction, but it doesn't work, and it's highly dangerous, because this money and this lobbying is really counterproductive. For example, do you think that a reduction of men who pay for sex might actually reduce the possibility of women contracting HIV. Yeah. Right. So reduce the demand, end the demand, eliminate the demand, and have an abolitionist approach to the sex trade, and it's clear that you're going to reduce HIV and AIDS. When there are women, and Sabrina will have something to say about this, I'm sure, when there are women in brothels under legalisation and decriminalisation, and she owes the brothel uh, manager money, and she doesn't have any money to take home, and she might be off her face on, on booze or whatever, and someone's offering double for sex without a condom, how is that going to work? So the, the only way to reduce HIV and AIDS within that particular massive widespread community, because remember, for every prostituted woman, there are loads more Johns, is to abolish the sex trade and not to think condom is the answer. I wonder if each of the panellists had a view on um, either the issue around the HIV AIDS um, kind of prevention, but also the whole, the way in which kind of um, gay um, sexuality has been brought in to uh, complicate the prostitution uh, debate. Do you want to go first? Yeah. Okay. Um, we have a thing called doubles over in Australia and New Zealand, and it's where you've got two women in prostitution with one punter. So you see what other women are doing. And uh, I used to do those kinds of um, jobs. Well, before decriminalisation, we were setting our own prices. So we also policed each other on safer sex or safe sex practices, which is condoms, dental dams, um, lube, all that kind of stuff. After decriminalisation went through, that was the first time I started seeing unsafe sex practices happening. And this is the irony, because one of the things that, you know, the other side of this debate says, those who are trying to get decriminalisation in, is, oh yeah, condoms are mandatory under law. Well, yeah, they are, but as Julie said, the police aren't actually in the bedroom, right? So women did this for extra money because the business pimps had lowered the prices to get more Johns through the door because, you know, they're making money off every single punter. So it's much better for them if they have 10 or 15 punters at once. That's why the prices get lower. And then they put, you know, 25 women on where it used to be five or six. So women are competing harder and harder and harder with each other to get those jobs or to get the money and then more of it's being taken off them. So they're left in a position of having to be able, well, having to do unsafe sex practices of some description. It's funny, it's making me think of all that debate we're having in London about Uber and about you know, the gig economy and how people that have a problem discussing um, people who drive taxis or deliver food actually having more protection. That's very interesting. Um, do you want to go ahead mm. next? Uh, <clears throat> How many times I've been offered, you know, in prostitution for the condomless lay. Lucky at that point in my life, I wasn't addicted 
because how many girls I've brought in, you know, that have to get rapid HIV testing. What we see in Canada is harm reduction isn't working. We are in an opioid crisis and with, you know, uh, exploited women, especially the Indigenous community, um, crack pipes and needles and condoms aren't, aren't stopping it. Uh, AIDS is, is prevalent. It, it's in our communities. But we had the whole harm <laughs> reduction talk uh, and have made it and mandated it that we do not believe in harm induction. I wouldn't be here today if I was offered a crack pipe mm. or a needle. I would be dead. Um, so for what we see in Canada is, you know, the, the spread of HIV with prostituted women and girls are from, are from the tricks. And the reason why I say this is anyone who's been in prostitution, the reason why we call them tricks is because they try to trick us. For, for someone to sit there and say, I've never had a bad experience, they're full of shit. How many times have they tried to rip off the condom and, and, and say, oh, it broke? You know, I, you know and that, it's quite common. It's quite common. And we're seeing that practice done more and more with the more, you know, the more sex work has, you know, been lifted. And what we're seeing is in the advertisements, in back pages, because in Canada you can advertise in back pages, it says no condom sex. No condom sex. Real girlfriend experience. Uh, me and you were having this conversation, Sabrina, about the girlfriend experience. And that's kissing and, 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 that, and the real intimate stuff that you do with someone you love is now being sold as an experience. And I told, <laughs> Sabrina, the first time I ever had to do the girlfriend experience, I vomited in the guy's mouth. <laughs> and he was mortified, and I was like, get out. <laughs> and my, the, my pimp was mad that I puked on the guy. And I remember he pulled up his pants, and they were filled with my vomit. <laughs> and I thought, aha, I hope his wife sees that one. <laughs> but like, like I said, you know, like, they just don't care. And for an extra $50, I've been offered up to $1,000. To me, my life wasn't worth it. And we did practices such as, you know, hid the condom in our mouth, and they'd say, I want a blowjob without a condom. And I'd say, yep. But I had a, always had a condom in my mouth, so when I went, I would put it on with my mouth. They had no idea. This is how stupid they are. No idea that they, they got a blowjob with a condom till after, and I'd say, dispose of your thing. You know, and, and that's why, you know, the, 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 the word trick is what they are. They are tricks. Thank you. There has been some change with the police, uh, well, in Minnesota, at least there was, in St. Paul. What was happening is, for it took a long time to get through to them, that they needed to stop arresting the women only. They would, what, what they would do is smack the back of the hand of the, the, the uh, sex buyer, tell him to go home, but they would take her to jail. And so we were having all these women come to our, our uh, office that were court ordered to our program from law enforcement. And so finally, uh, we got through to one officer who was called in, a uh, 17-year-old had just been beat up badly by her pimp. And he was the officer that was called. He took this 17-year-old to the hospital and sat with her all night, and she told him what, was, what had happened to her. That next day, he came to me and said, I want to talk to you. Tell me now, what do you want us to do? How is this working? So he and I had a good talk. And he went back and began to educate the other officers that they needed to stop arresting women and bring them straight to breaking free rather than to arrest them. And that's what started happening for a good while. The women weren't getting arrested. They were just coming to our office. And then what happened was there was a changing, I say changing of the guards. We got a new chief of police. And the new chief of police that came in didn't want to go that way. He went back to the old way. 
we have to keep arresting the women. But the men are still being arrested now too, but what's happening is we have a John school. Men are also court ordered to our program. And they go to an eight hour uh, day, it's a class that we have on a Saturday. And they hear from different women, they hear from people in the community. What we do is we talk about how their behavior impacts themselves, the women that they buy, and their families, because many of them are married. The majority of men that come to our John School are married. So um, the police, I mean, it, it, it worked for a while, but it goes back and forth. It just de de depends on who's in control at the police department. But you do have some who do get it and Thank do you. understand it. But the some are not enough. Um, just not Sabrina enough. next, and then Bridget, go ahead. Yeah, the police are another problem that we just exchanged for the courtrooms. So the police are now great. They're not um, arresting women anymore because women in the trade aren't criminals. But I'll give you an example of how our courts are letting us down. A woman was tied up, beaten, raped, mugged in the trade. He took her phone and after he'd actually paid, he actually took that money back. Um, she took him to court. The court found him guilty of theft he had to pay her for the phone, I think it was $300. He had to um, give her the money back that he took off her, but he was not found guilty of rape, beating, torturing, because he said she agreed to it. And because it, this was in New South Wales under decriminalisation, she had to prove that she didn't agree to it. And how do you do that? You can't. Bridget. Well, <clears throat> we've made giant leaps forward with policing in Canada. Um, I personally work with York Regional Police and Toronto Sex Crimes, which was formerly known as the Morality Unit, <laughs> <laughs> which was bad cops sent to the Morality Unit. So the officer who I work with, with York Regional Police, He's actually from my hometown. Um, he said he, does, he did the work that he does because of growing up with me uh, and watching what I went through and another girl who uh, went through the prostitution experience with me uh, and didn't make it out. What we're seeing now is survivor leadership having roles in training law enforcement. So right now I train RCMP, provincial police, local police, you know, even railway police, transit police. So now we're in there. Um, we are, both me and my business partner in Canada are the first survivors to teach at accredited college a police foundations program. Um, and you know, it, it's slowly, you know, it's baby steps. Um, some cops get it and some cops don't. And we're there to make sure they get it. And I can't bash the police. We know that there's major break, uh, breakdowns with the police in the First Nations community. Um, and, you know, with hopefully with more training that they will understand the whole intergenerational trauma and you know so on. Thank you Thank so you. much. Right. I have to say this. When we did Bill C thirty six, I would look at the Christian ladies and I'd be like, it's time to pray now. Right? <laughs> I said, start praying for us. You know? <laughs> What, we, 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 it was weird. It was, it was like a Molly crew. <laughs> you know, they, we got the indigenous real solidarity, the Radfems, the survivors, and the Evangelical Society of Canada, <laughs> and the conservative government. And we all worked together. We knew what our strengths were, and we just, we decided to kumbaya, powwow it out, and just be. <laughs> We, we didn't want to let Terry Jean Bedford win. We were against that dominatrix and we aligned really strong. But what we, what, who failed us were the Liberal government in Canada. Yep. Because they decided to invite the Dancers Association of Canada, which is funded by the Hells Angels, to the standing committee and me 
uh, I was testifying after them and my, my abuser were organized crime, my, my exploiter. So it was so funny because the liberal, the government, and who's in power right now in Canada are the liberals. And they are doing massive damage. And, you know, <laughs> liberal feminism is killing us. And we have to know that, you know, I'm not going to sit there and allow that to happen. I have five reasons why, well, six reasons, five including daughters of mine and six being my granddaughter. Guess in the book. Right, thank you very much for no, that, thank Rahila. thank you for your thoughts. Um, I, trafficking is merely a process within the sex trade. That, that's all, it's a process, it couldn't happen without the global sex trade. The global sex trade just allows a particular process to happen to some women and girls, men and boys, within prostitution. But I call it international pimping. And so one thing that I was really minded to do was not use any statistics, pretend to know any numbers, pretend to have any... I didn't want to, to, to pull a reader in by saying, trafficking is so terrible. Uh, Child sexual exploitation is so terrible. Now read the book and find out how it's all really bad. Because you lose everyone. Because people will stick with the usual nonsense that trafficking bad, prostitution is fine. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I purposely focused on what I call the global sex trade and, and, and identified trafficking as a process. I'm not even sure if I've answered your question. No, no, but it gave me a great opportunity to say it anyway. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I mean, pimps are fairly stupid. Brothel owners think that any publicity is good publicity. They're, they're business entrepreneurs. They're, it's all about money. And so when I went to visit Dennis Hoff's um, rape camps in Nevada, um, the hideous uh, brothels in, in, in Germany, the legal brothels, uh, the brothels in, in the Netherlands, and when I interviewed pimps um, in various places, they gave me access. Most of them didn't bother Googling me, and those that did <laughs> just thought that, you know, this was a way that they could advertise their business. So that bit was easy. I'll tell you what was hard, was finding the uh, pro-prostitution lobbyists to talk to me. Um, the academics shut down. One academic who I tried to get to talk to about this issue um, is a disability rights campaigner and an academic. And when I said to her, isn't this a disgrace that people are saying, like using disabled men as a human shield to justify sex buying, could I interview you literally about that? After about a week, she came back and said, I really can't. I work in academia. And if I was quoted even in a non critical way in your book, um, I'm afraid that the sex workers' rights activists would refuse to speak to me. So the ones that were a nightmare to get to, apart from those within legalisation, uh, were the, idea, the, the, the ideologues, the, the, those that are lobbyists for, for decriminalisation. They, they just wouldn't have it. I mean, I still managed to talk to some, but very few. Thank you. As we kind of towards the end, we should say much of your book is about how the pro decriminalising lobby builds its power, how it operates now. But the book does end on a positive note, focused on the future and how the abolitionist movement is dealing with the challenge. Mm -hmm. Could you tell us a bit about mm -hmm. it? Well, one thing that is very striking um, about this issue, which isn't, it's, this isn't a single issue, this is within the campaign to end uh, male supremacy and oppression and violence towards women and girls. So it's very much an anti patriarchal project. Um, and what, one, thing that, one thing that is notable, and this is even from some feminists or some well-meaning people, some good people, is that they have the most pessimistic view of the quest for abolitionism of any political activist I have ever met. So political activists that we like, I'm assuming no one here is from UKIP or, or the far right, campaigning for repatriation of, of, of people of colour. But uh, let's just assume that we're all campaigning for um, largely, spe widely speaking, a better world um, with, with less oppression, poverty uh, and inequality. Well, people can visualise an end to child poverty 
When we campaign to end child sexual abuse, we say we want a world without child sexual abuse. We know this is perfectly not just possible and desirable, but inevitable when feminism achieves its goal and overturns male oppression so that we truly are liberated from this, right? Now, this is what makes the abolitionist movement so brilliant, and this is why we'll win. Because we all have a view of a world without prostitution. We can envisage a world without the sex trade because it would be impossible to have a sex trade if male oppression of women were to end. It couldn't exist. It would starve of oxygen. So thinking about the way in which the abolitionist movement is growing in various countries gives me real hope. I often say to men, feminists like me are your best friend. We actually are the ones who don't think that you were born bad. We don't think that you were programmed to rape or by sex. We don't think that you were born with any stamp in your DNA that programs you to abuse women or even have to have power over us. And we say, we know that your behaviour can and must change, and that raising boys under the Nordic model, the abolitionist model, in countries like Sweden and France and Ireland and the north of Ireland and other countries, means that those young people truly are growing up with the notion that it is unacceptable to rent an orifice for 10 minutes for one-sided sexual pleasure. And this is what's happening, for example, in Sweden, where we've had the law criminalising demand since 1999. Not only have we seen a normative change, where 80% of the general public support this law, a set of laws, because it's about helping women out of the industry as well and decriminalising those in prostitution. But when the law was introduced, most people, including the police, were against it. Have a think about the tobacco industry. Look at what changes have been made, not in all countries, but in some countries, where we're looking towards, basically, the abolition of smoking and also the support to help people stop smoking. Now, that's an addiction. Some people tell me it's a worse addiction than heroin. And buying sex is not a necessity. As my good friend Fiona says, their knobs won't drop off <laughs> if they don't get their rocks off when they want it. <laughs> so just very, very briefly, I'm just going to read you a page of my conclusion. And then I would really love to hear just some concluding remarks. Um, in Germany, Holland and Australia, survivors are speaking out against the legal brothels in which they were sold. In New Zealand, the truth is emerging about how so-called decriminalisation is no different from the disastrous legalisation approach and that nothing has improved for those prostituted under this regime. Those governments, policy makers, service providers and individuals who argue that the sex trade can never be abolished and therefore should be regulated and managed are lacking in imagination. The same attitude is never applied to poverty, child abuse or cancer. The fight against the tobacco industry is perhaps a good analogy with the campaign to end the normalisation, pimping, brothel owning and sex buying. The message from those pimps and punters that seek to legalise the entire industry is that the sex trade is a harmless industry that causes little or no damage. The rich and powerful tobacco industry held the ground for decades peddling propaganda about how cigarettes were glamorous and sophisticated, and even convincing many that smoking could cure a sore throat. I mean, you're desperate for a fag break, those of you here, by the way. <laughs> it won't be long. <laughs> In the post-war years, things began to change. Pressure groups were set up as doctors began connecting a range of diseases to smoking. But until they were left with little choice, the tobacco profiteers refused to accept those facts and produced their own experts to argue the opposite. Do you see where I'm going with this? We know the tactics and the strategies of the pro-sex trade movement. It's being exposed by the very women who were in it, who tell the truth. And so we can see an end to prostitution because nothing else is acceptable. And you only have two roads that you can go down with prostitution. You can't ever take a middle road. It has to be abolition or legalisation and decriminalisation. And we know which one we're going to get. So, 
So to end, I want to ask each of our panellists, um, starting at the end with you, Vanita, mm -hmm. um, just to give a minute or so on your final thoughts on the issue and anything you've heard tonight. Go I guess my, I just keep it plain and simple. We have to end this and we have to end it now. We can't, con we can't continue to let this prostitution go on. And uh, with that, I'm just going to say, buy the book. The book could tell it all. <laughs> Bridget next. I, I'm the same. <laughs> I think my jet lag's kind of kicked in. <laughs> Anyways, we know that the end is coming near. And, you know, I, I just, to those that doubt it, it's going to happen. I know for my children and my grandchildren and for Indigenous women and girls that we are, we are, are going to make sure that no more stolen sisters. Yeah. And, and that's my final word. Sabrina. Around the world, the majority won out. But even if that wasn't true, say it was flip side up, how many victims are we willing to sacrifice for male orgasm? Mm -hmm. To me, it's none. I would just say, I want to go back to something at the very beginning of the book, which is Julie talks about part of what got her thinking about working in women's rights. And it was something which I remember too, which is the reporting of the Yorkshire Ripper case, which is, you know, not that long ago to many of us, it was in the early 80s. This was a man who went around murdering women. And some of them happened to be um, prostitute women. But the police... Remember that point where they said, oh, but now you've started to kill innocent women? And that whole labelling of women, that dividing of women into good women and bad women, um, you know, that is part of the horror. And that's not that long ago. And now we're in a weird situation where somehow we're being divided again against each other when actually we are all on the same side. So I found this whole evening amazing and empowering, especially I feel we're in a really dark time, actually. And I think it's so important that books like this are being written, which aren't afraid to tell us how difficult it is, but are looking forward. And all these amazing women who have such important stories to tell about how we can fight and change the future. So thank you all. As I say, it's been nothing but an honour for me. Please, all of you stay, enjoy a drink, network, and buy your copy of the book, and Judy will sign it.